1846, the United States and Canada were sort of tired of the constant threat of war against one another. And so they decided to build a bridge to unify the two countries over the Niagara River. Now, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, like I have multiple times, you know the thought of building a bridge from one side to the other is a pretty daunting task. Keep in mind, this is 1846. We're talking an 825-foot wide river, 225-foot cliffs on either side of it, and every single second, 3,160 tons of water flow down over the falls. It's 1846. They don't yet have boats powerful enough to be able to travel across a river like that. But yet, a bridge got built. You're going, how in the world were they able to pull that off? And the answer is simple, a kite flying contest. It was won by a young man by the name of Homan Walsh. He was 15 years old. He had answered an ad in the newspaper, and he won $10 as a cash prize for being able to successfully fly a kite from one side to the other. And once somebody on the other side was able to catch that kite, now they had a string connecting Canada to the U.S. And what they did then is they tied a little bit bigger of a string to it, and they pulled that all the way across. Once that was pulled across, they attached a rope. Once that was attached, they pulled it all the way across. Once that came all the way across, they attached a cable. They pulled all that across. And that is what allowed engineers then to have enough structure and stability to actually get the bridge started. It was two years later then, on August the 1st of 1848, that the very first horse and buggy crossed over the bridge connecting the United States and Canada. Seven years later, after further construction, railroad ties had gone down, and now a 23-ton locomotive was able to cross over the bridge. And to think it all started with a single kite. One single kite being flown across is what allowed a bridge to be built. And today, as we continue our series called Win the Day, that's what I want to talk to you about. It's our fourth habit, which is fly the kite. Now, if you got a Bible today, go ahead and turn to Zechariah chapter 4. Again, Zechariah chapter 4. I do want to welcome those of you that are watching online with us right now in the upper right-hand corner of your screen there. You notice there is a little button. It's there. It's called Talk Notes. If you push that, that's going to give you all the scriptures we're going to look at today, as well as all the fill-in-the-blanks. Those of you that are live in the room, welcome to you as well. If you pull out your smartphone, you can go to our website, exponential.church. You can find all the scriptures and the fill in the blanks there as well. Now, as you continue to turn there to Zechariah chapter 4, let me give you just a little bit of context. It was 585 BC, and Babylon came in and conquered Israel. We talked about this just a little bit last week. So they, they come in, they capture the capital city of Jerusalem, and they destroy the temple and they carry the people off in the captivity. It's 50 years later that a young man by the name of Zerubbabel actually comes back to Israel with a small remnant of people. Now, Zerubbabel himself, his parents have been carried off into captivity, but he had been born in Babylon. But he has this dream. He wants to go back with the Jews and be able to rebuild the temple. And so they arrive back, and he is just looking all around, complete and utter devastation. And as he sees the rubble and, and this task of trying to rebuild the temple, it had to seem very overwhelming to him. And so that's when God speaks through the prophet Zechariah to sort of give a word of encouragement to Zerubbabel and to all the people. That's where we'll pick up the story, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. God, speaking through Zechariah, says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. I am the Lord all-powerful, so don't depend on your might or your power, but on my spirit. You know what? I want to say the same thing to you. God wants to do amazing things through you, but it's not going to be about you. It's going to be because of his might and because of his power and because of his spirit working inside of you. Now, I want to be honest about something. I've had some of you actually share this with me, and then I've heard it through the grapevine from some other people as well that, you know, people talk about me behind my back. I understand that. That's fine, right? Uh, but the, here, here's the thing, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but here's the thing that, that I've heard. Some of you are actually, because of my experiences in the past of, you know, I've led hundreds of people in a relationship with Jesus, my work with Rick Warren, and, and you know, I trained 10,000 churches and trained 30,000 pastors and stuff. Some of you are actually intimidated by me. 
And I'm like, what, me? Why? Because, you know, here's the deal. Like, when I was in school, I was an okay student, but I'm actually not all that smart. When it comes to size and strength, I'm way below average when it comes to that. And I've shared with you guys in the past, when it comes to most things in life, I am a complete idiot, all right? Uh, to use a sports analogy, you know, the, the old cliche, you know, I put my pants legs on one leg at a time, just like you do, all right? Uh, so I'm just an average, ordinary people. I struggle with sin. I struggle with, you know, doubts and, and all kinds of things, just like you do. I'm an average person. Here's the deal, though. I have this unwavering faith that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of me. And it's because of that spirit that I can do great and mighty things for him. But that doesn't make me special. You have the same spirit living inside of you. You can do great and mighty things for him. The, the Apostle Paul, he, he puts it this way. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do what? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not some things, but all things. And not because of your power, not because of your strength, but because his strength and because his power. It was this verse that Karen heard, I don't know how many years ago now, Karen, almost 10 years ago probably now, that she heard this verse 10 years ago. And she said, well, wait a second, maybe that's speaking about me, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that's why she started her, her ministry. I can. And it's based off of this verse that I can do all things. And think about what the journey has been these past 10 years, that it started with a little card table once a quarter downtown giving out clothes. Now it's every single month. It's multiple locations throughout the Harrisburg area. It's multiple uh, 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 uh card tables and, and, and eight foot tables and various things. I, I was getting I was getting ahead of myself because I was just thinking we just like downstairs, we just tore out a whole big wall because she needs more room for all the clothes that you guys are able to provide. It's absolutely amazing what has happened. But here's what Karen would tell you. She would say, isn't about me. Isn't my strength, it's not my power. In fact, I, and I asked her permission if, if I could share this. She was sharing a story with us this past Thursday night after rehearsal was done. She had somebody in her life this past week that's basically calling her stupid, that you're dumb. You can't do anything. Well, on him or her, right? No, she can't. And I don't know what her IQ is or how smart she is. But here's what I do know. God is using her to do great and mighty things. Why? Because it's his power in her. It's his power in me. And it's his power in you that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So listen, I, I don't know what it is that you're facing today, but you can because it's his strength. Here's what Zechariah continues on in prophesying. Look at verse 7. He says, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. Listen, I don't know what your mountain is that you're facing today. Maybe it's anxiety or it's addiction or anger. Maybe it's a, a mountain of debt that you're facing or, or unforgiveness. Maybe for you, your mountain is depression or frustration or fear. I don't know, maybe you even have a whole mountain range <laughs> that you're facing. It's not just one thing. You've got multiple things that you're facing. But here's what I do know. Eventually, we all have to come to the place where we stop talking to God about the mountain that's in front of us, and we start have to talking to the mountain about our God. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. At some point, you have to stop complaining. You have to stop even praying to God about the mountain that you're facing. And you have to start talking to that mountain about the size of your God. That there is nothing that stands before me that can stop me. And really, that's habit number one. It's about flipping the script. That you start declaring to God and to the mountain. Look, this is, this is who you've created me to be, God. This is what you've given me the authority and the power to do. And you start speaking to that anxiety. You start speaking to that addiction. You, you start speaking to that trouble that's in your life. And you start telling the mountain about your God. You start talking about his love and his grace and his power and his healing and his goodness. And that's not denying the obstacle that's there before you. It's just flipping the script. It's realizing that your God is bigger 
and your God is stronger. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And Jesus says, nothing will be impossible for you. The writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us that God is the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what that means for you is that the same God that helped Moses to part the Red Sea could do that for you. The same God who helped Peter to walk on the water could do that for you. The same God who used somebody like Paul to lay his hands on somebody and, and, and raise the dead and heal the sick, he can do that through you. We just sang the song. Did, did you truly believe it or were you lying when you said, I've seen you move, you've moved the mountains and I believe I'll see you do it again. Do you really believe that or not? That's the power. That's the strength that you have. Not you, but the Spirit of God living inside of you. And so we need to learn to start walking in that. Now, what I find cool about these couple of verses that we've read here in Zechariah so far is that it actually represents all the habits that we've talked about in the series. Habit number one, flip the script. Start talking to the mountain. Tell the mountain about the size of your God. Habit number two, then, was kiss the wave. Remember, the obstacle is not the enemy. The obstacle will actually bring you to Jesus. It'll bring you closer to Jesus. Gives you strength in your faith. Habit three, eat the frog. How are you going to move the mountain? Well, probably one little next step at a time. It's probably not going to move all at once. I mean, that can happen. That's a miracle, but it's probably going to be a little small next step. You're going to leverage small habits until it has a domino effect that builds up so much momentum that it topples that mountain down on your behalf. Remember what I shared with you last week, and actually, I think even the week before. If you want God to do the super, you've got to be willing to do the natural, which then leads to habit number four, which is fly the kite. Zechariah continues on. And he's prophesying. And it's actually a verse that we looked at last week. Look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work to begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. A, a plumb line is a, a, an instrument that's used to, to help keep things level or mark level, to, to get angles at the right way. And this is interesting because that's all that Zerubbabel has so far. He just has a plumb line in his hand, but yet God is already rejoicing. They haven't even shoveled the first dirt out yet. They haven't moved the first stone yet. They don't even have their building permit yet, right? All they have is a blueprint. All they have is a dream and this plumb line. And already God's like on his feet giving them a standing ovation. Going, yeah, look at that. It's just a dream. It's just a plumb line. It's just a kite string. Do not despise the day of humble beginnings. Mark Batterson in his book, Win the Day, which we're basing this series off of, he says this, God isn't just great because nothing is too big for him. God is also great because nothing is too small for him either. Listen, I, I know I tell you all the time, that God wants to use you to change the world. And he does. He wants you to change the world. But the reality is your job isn't to change the world. Your job is to simply fly the kite, to do the little thing that God is calling you to do. And it's God then that will come along and build the bridge on your behalf. And so if you'll do the little small things, if you'll win every single day, as I said last week, God will do the big things. So if you'll do the little things like they're big things, then God will do the big things like their little things. So let me give you three keys then to flying the kite. Three things that you can do to start today. So number one, if you're taking notes, is this. I must give myself a start date. You've got to give yourself a start date. Now, I first met Mark Batterson back in 2006. It was right after Mark wrote his very first book. And Mark has been so generous to me through the years with his time and his wisdom. And I think I shared this with you in the first week of the series. Uh, Mark and his church, National Community Church down in D.C., actually helped to fund getting Exponential Church started back in 2010. And so, you know, anytime Mark comes out with a new book, I'm like super excited to, to read it and see how God is speaking through him. 
Now, here's the ironic thing about, you know, that I'm so excited to read each and every one of Mark's books. Mark actually, when he was 22 years old, felt called to start writing books, but he had just been told by his college professors, he had just done an assessment, that you are not very good at English. You should do anything in life but write. Mark's like, but I'm being called to write. And they're like, nope. You are a terrible writer. You don't have the gifts. You don't have the skills. You don't have the abilities. Do not write. Do not waste your life writing. Pretty harsh, right? <laughs> but Mark felt this call that I've got to write. So you know what he did? He didn't write. His way of flying a kite was he read 3,000 books before he even attempted to write a book. Mark's like, if I'm not a good writer, what I'll do is I'll learn from people who are good writers, and I'll try to reverse engineer all the things that they're doing and learn the, the, the tips and the techniques, and hopefully that'll translate when I start to, to write then. But even after reading 3,000 books, Mark still didn't write a book. You know what he did instead? He instead started writing out word for word every single one of his sermons, and he would actually read it as a manuscript. What was he trying to do? He was trying to get better at writing. And then he would turn those sermons into devotionals that he would send out via email. After that, then he started a blog, and that got going. But now, fast forward, we're 12 years later, he still hasn't written a book, and what is he feeling called to do? Write a book. And so he said, you know what? I am not going to turn 35 years old and not have a book to show for it. And so he's 34 at the time. He says, I, I'm not going to turn 35 without a book. So not only did he set himself a deadline, but then what he did was he decided to set himself a start date. And guess what day he decided to start writing the book? When? That day, right? He decided to win the day. That I can't write a book in an entire day, but I could at least write a couple pages today. And in Mark's words, he wrote two crappy pages every single day until his first book got released. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. That first book, and I'm only being honest with you because Mark himself would say this. <laughs> it was crappy. <laughs> it's not a very good book. However, by writing that very first book, it gave him the momentum. It gave him the confidence to continue to write. Here's the, here's the thing. 16 years later now, Mark's written 20 books, sold millions and millions of copies, and multiple times has been at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Win the day. It's not about you. It's not about your gifts. It's not about your skills, your talents. It's got spirit in you. And if you've been called to do something, then go out and actually start doing it. But you can't accomplish it all in one day. So what do you do? You win the day. You do what you can today. The next day you do the same thing. The next day you do the same thing. All of a sudden you got a little winning streak going. All of a sudden you got some momentum. And the next thing you know, you're a New York Times bestselling author. Or you started a great ministry downtown serving people or whatever it is that God is calling you to do. You got to set yourself not just a deadline, you got to set for yourself a start date. So what is it that you've been dreaming? What is it that you felt called to do? Whatever it is, you'll never achieve it unless you start. So you got to start today. But Gilbert, I'm not qualified. Gilbert, I don't have the experience. Gilbert, I'm not educated enough. Well, guess what? Mark was told not to write. Did you know I'd only been a pastor for three years when Rick Warren asked me to go out and train all of North America's pastors? And I'd only been a Christian for 10 years at that point. So it really was. It's not about me. It was about God working in me. God working in Mark and God working in Karen. God working in you. So go out and win the day. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. The Lord replied, my gift of undeserved grace is all that you need. My power is strongest when. My power is strongest when you are weak. Not when you're strong. God's power is strongest in you when you are weak. 
somebody once wisely said this, that God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the called. Let me say that again. God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the called. You know, but Gilbert, I don't know if I'm ready yet. Well, guess what? Who is? Were you ready for almost any? Were you ready to get married? Were you ready to have kids? Were you ready to, to make a major career change? No, we're never ready for things. But yet you did it anyway, and it's all worked out. So just win the day. The time to start is right now. So number one, give yourself a start date. Number two, I must dream big, but then start small. Now, I talked about this last week. And so I'm not going to really talk a lot about it here today, but the, the story I, I told you there at the beginning about, you know, flying the kite, it was this dream of we want to build a bridge from one side to the other. You know, build a bridge like that in a day, especially over the Niagara River. So how did it start? It started with not even flying a kite. You know how it started? It started with putting an ad in a newspaper saying, kite flying contest, winner gets $10 cash. Again, if you will fly the kite, God will build the bridge. So you got to start somewhere. Dream big, but start small. So what you need to do is take your big dream and then reverse engineer it. What's that big thing that God has called you to do? This dream that you have. Well, in order to have the dream, what is the thing that would have to happen right before that? And the thing right before that? And the thing right before that? And the thing right before that? And just keep going until it gets down to the little small thing like, oh, we need to put an ad in the newspaper. Kite flying contest. That you can do, right? You can do something small like that. And then once you've done that little small thing, then you do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and it just continues to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger until finally the the bridge is built and your dream has been met so just keep doing the little things and don't ever give up jesus says this in luke 16 10 whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much and so dream big but be faithful to the small things until god makes your dream come true and as I said to you last week, always remember your why. Why is it that you're doing what it is that you're doing? Because that's going to help to keep you motivated. I love the story. It was in the mid-1600s in London. They had a, a great fire, and it burned most of the city down, including St. Paul's Cathedral. And the story is told of the guy that was sort of the architect overseeing everything that was happening in the reconstruction of it. And he was walking along the job site one day, and he came across three bricklayers. And he individually talked to each and every one of them. He said to the first bricklayer, he said, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm laying bricks. He went to the second bricklayer and he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm rebuilding a wall. He went to the third guy and he says, what are you doing? And that guy said, I am rebuilding a cathedral for the glory of God. Three different men asked the exact same question. They're all doing the exact same task, but yet they had three different responses. One guy remembered the why. Why is it that I'm doing this mundane thing like lying or laying bricks here? Why am I doing this? It's for the glory of God. And I want to say the exact same thing to you. Remember your why because it'll make the small, boring, and even the hard tasks all worthwhile. Let's face it, you know, putting the ad in the newspaper, so to speak, flying the kite, sometimes those little small things it's boring, it's mundane, you can get monotonous. Because sometimes you gotta keep doing the same thing over and over and over again to get a little bit of momentum going. But if you remember your why, it'll make it all worthwhile. So number one was give yourself a start date. Number two, you gotta dream big, but start small. Number three then, if I want every day to count, then I must learn to count the days. Listen, if you're not counting the days, then you're discounting the days. And that's not just a clever play on words. We have got to come to the understanding that our days are limited here. Our days are numbered. Our days are short. So we can't be wasting this precious time that we have. David reminds us in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days so that we can use wisely all the time that we have. 
the very beginning of the series, I asked you a question. Can you do it for just one day? And what we discovered is, yeah, I can do whatever it is that God's called me to do for just one day. I can eat right. I could exercise. I could read my Bible. I could pray. I, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, I could do it for one day. And what we also discovered is almost anybody could do almost anything just for one day. The key is to just keep doing it over and over and over again. Kite flying is simply doing the little small thing that you can do. And I don't care if it's that you're training for a marathon or you're trying to read your Bible all the way through. If you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. So in the same way we count calories, in the same way that we count dollars when we're on a budget, you've got to learn to start counting your days. You got to count the days because the days are short. You do not know the day or the hour that either Jesus is coming back or the day of your death is coming for you. So you got to maximize each and every day that you've been given. If you want to break records, you've got to learn to keep records. You've got to learn to, to measure those things that matter because if it isn't measurable, then it's not going to be manageable in your life. So start to count the days. Keep track of, did I win the day or not? And I want to throw this in as well. Don't just wait until the end when you've met that big dream and God's help to, to do that through you. Don't wait until then to celebrate. Celebrate the little milestones along the way because that's going to help to keep you motivated and keep you going as well. I'll close in today with this. Remember, Zechariah said, do not despise these days of small beginnings. I mean, even though this rebuild, it, it looks overwhelming, just win the day. Just do the small thing you can today. And so the people got to work and they started rebuilding and it was hard and it was boring sometimes. And they faced opposition, not just from neighboring countries, but even some of their own Jewish people were opposing them as they were trying to rebuild. But finally, finally, in 516 BC, the new temple was dedicated. But even then, some of the Jews weren't impressed. Some of them were going, well, what is this? I mean, Solomon's original temple that he built, it was much bigger than this. And some of them were going, you know, when Solomon's temple was originally built, the glory of God fell that day. We dedicated this little thing and nothing happened. And that's when the prophet Haggai spoke up. And he prophesied this in Haggai 2.9. The future glory of this temple will be what? The future glory of this temple will be, shout it out, greater than the glory of the former one, says the Lord Almighty. You understand what Haggai is prophesying here? Yeah, Solomon's temple, it was big and the glory of God fell that day. But Haggai is saying, God is saying to us that this little small temple, this new temple, the glory in this one one day is going to be even greater than Solomon's temple. And guess what? 550 years later, that was fulfilled when a little 12-year-old boy walked through the doors of that temple. His name was Jesus. And the glory of God filled the place. The people were amazed by the teaching that Jesus was giving. Why? Because Jesus was God in the flesh. God himself literally had entered there into the temple. So remember, you being faithful to do the little small things, you being faithful to win each and every day, it isn't just about you. It's also about future generations as well. So do the little small thing that you can do. Go out and fly the kite. Go out and win the day. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, so much for Just this simple reminder that it's not about us. It's all about you. It's not about our strength. It's about your power being made perfect in our weakness. And so, you know, a lot of us, we're just not smart. We're just not strong. We're not powerful. We're, we don't have a lot of gifts and skills and abilities and talents. 
But yet you take that little bit that we have and you say, all right, I'm going to bless that if you're just faithful to winning the day, doing the little small thing, not despising the day of humble beginnings. And so, Lord, as we've seen through the examples in Scripture, as we've seen through the example of, of Mark and myself and Karen and others, Lord, it is truly not about us because we were told that there was a lot of things that we couldn't do or who we weren't. But yet, look at what you have allowed us to do. And Father, we give you all the glory and the praise and the honor for that, that you showed up and you showed off. Lord, I pray that this message has been an inspiration and encouragement for every single person, whether they're live here in the room, whether they're watching online or they're watching online sometime in the future, that, Lord, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Lord, I pray that each and every person would just make that a, a scripture memory verse for themselves this week until it becomes not just a part of their mind, but it becomes something that's in their heart and it actually flows out of them that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not some things, but all things. Lord, you want to partner with us to do great and mighty things. So help give us the confidence, the confidence just to do the little small next step that you're calling us to do today. Help us to win today and then be faithful to do it again tomorrow and be obedient to the next step the day after that and the day after that. And Lord, I, I can't wait to hear the stories in the future six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, 20 years from now. Lord, you, you preached that message the last Sunday of January in 2022. And that was the day that I realized that I can do all things. And that that dream that God has given me, that call that he has on my life, that was the day that I started. I set myself a start date and it was that day. And look at where God has me now. Jesus, thank you that you're going to use us in those ways. And I pray all this in your great, in your holy, in your precious name. Amen.